UFC 288. These are the full card predictions and the betting breakdown. Main event, Aljamain Sterling versus Henry Cejudo. Epic comeback for Cejudo, trying to take the belt from Aljo. Looking forward to the card. We're going to talk about each of the matchups. Make sure you guys smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Turn those post notifications on and make sure to share the video as well. Also note, full card fight companion, 6 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday. Do not miss it. Let's get into the first fight of the night. We have Daniel Willie Cat Santos and Johnny Munoz Jr. I'm picking Willie Cat to win. I'll be honest with you guys. If you follow the channel, you know I like Willie Cat. I'm a Willie Cat fan. I think he's got a super entertaining fight style. Tough as hell. Trains with a savage team with Oliveira, the Diego Lima, shoot their box killers out there. He's got nasty ground skills. High pressure style. Good finishing ability. Power too. On the opposite side, Johnny Munoz. In my opinion, he's a decent fighter overall, good wrestling game, solid enough striking, a little bit stiff with his boxing, and I also do feel like the chin is slightly in question. He was knocked out quickly by Tony Gravely. Daniel Santos got power to get KOs. I think that he can explode and hurt Munoz, especially if Munoz gets open and up on the feet because Willie Cat is going to put that pace on him. So I'm going to go Willie Cat to get the win. How does he do it? I'm leaning knockout win. Sub wouldn't be impossible inside distance, but we're calling it KO for Daniel Willie Cat Santos. I think he's putting Johnny Munoz to bed here. He's going to find a sniper shot and put him out, potentially club and sub too. So inside distance, I guess, if you're prop betting it. But looking at the money line odds, Willie Cat's slight favorite, minus 147. Johnny Munoz Jr. at plus 127. So the line's not crazy wide. Fairly competitive, and in my opinion, makes sense. Obviously, a little money's come down on Munoz on the dog side because the line has got a little bit closer. But I think Willie Cat gets him out of there. I think there's going to be a finish, and it's going in the favor of Willie Cat to get it done. My guy, Willie Cat, for the stoppage win. We'll call it KO. Next fight on the card. We got Joseph Holmes versus Claudio Hiberio. I'm going to pick Claudio Hiberio to win. I actually think he puts Joseph Holmes' lights out at some point. But I'll tell you guys, I'm not overly impressed by Hiberio, especially after the debut, watching some more fights from him on the regional level. He's dangerous as fuck. He plants his feet. He throws big power. Doesn't have a great jab. Isn't awesome on the ground. And it's kind of one-dimensional. He wants knockouts. Great Muay Thai, but it's knockout-based. Joseph Holmes on the other side, good from distance, long kickboxer, and also a guy that, you know, did well as an amateur. He was unbeaten there. But the biggest issue and the reason that I pick Hiberio to win by knockout here is because Joseph Holmes lacks any punching power and he does not have a significant wrestling threat. So I feel like if he had better takedowns, you try to chain wrestle Hiberio, put him in bad spots, maybe submit him. I don't see that as a significant threat there. Holmes is too tall to have a strength advantage at 185 over Hiberio, in my opinion. Looking at the power, it's way in favor of Hiberio. He's going to knock him out, I think. I think Joseph Holmes at some point gets caught with a big punch and he gets his lights put out. You look at all 10 of the wins for Hiberio are knockout wins. He's a knockout guy. I don't see Joseph Holmes sleeping him. I don't see the power for him. I don't see the wrestling offense. So maybe pure jujitsu a little bit better for Holmes if he's able to find the position because he does have solid submissions. But I just don't see him getting it into those spots. A guy that I worry about with Hiberio is someone physically strong who can wrestle a bit better. Like even Al-Hassan, judo background, was able to put it on him with that pressure. Holmes isn't going to have that option. He's going to be forced to fight in the striking realm where, in my opinion, Hiberio has... A tenfold power advantage. So give me the knockout for Hiberio. I think he's sleeping, ugly man Holmes. Holmes the dog at plus 175. Hiberio minus 200. I think the 2-1 to one favorite's taking it, man. I think is going to end up knocking him out. Holmes is a guy that could make it a difficult fight, but because of past UFC history and fights, I mean... Lost to Jamie Pickett, not a good look. Win against Alan Emadovsky, who's not all that high caliber at all. John Young Park lost. Joseph Holmes is not an underdog that I want to really be backing because I just don't have substantial confidence in his ability to win fights at you know the UFC level just yet. Young guy's still improving, but ultimately I think Hiberio's too powerful for him. So we're going Hiberio to knock him out. Next fight. On the card, we got Jalgash Jumagulov and Rafael Estevam. 
I'm going to pick Estevam to get the win. He's got a big size advantage on Zumagulov, four inches taller, longer reach. He's got good takedowns and grappling. I think he's got the better jiu-jitsu. Zumagulov could make it tricky because he is actually a pretty quality wrestler. But ultimately, like, picking Zumagulov to me is just off the table. I mean, he's got lost Jeff Molina, Charles Johnson, a lot of losses here. Uh, we got Menel Kopp knocking him out. Amir Albazi beat him. His one win as of recent is Jerome Rivera, who was nowhere near UFC level. And now you're matching him up with a straight Brazilian killer, someone from Brazil that has tremendous grappling skills. And actually, when I look for a grappler, what I like is grapplers who punch you in the face when they are in dominant position as they work towards setting up submissions. That's what Estevam does. So if he's able to get good positioning on a Zumagulov, I think he's doing damage with strikes too. He's peppering at him. He's beating him up. Ultimately, I got to respect the overall durability of Zhumagulov, longtime MMA veteran, but he loses a fuckload of fights. And I think that Estevam, if you're even matching up takedown abilities, is going to be better. He's going to be stronger. He's going to be bigger. He's going to have better grappling overall. I think he gets good positions on Zhumagulov and he beats him. Ultimately, the method of victory, though Estevam is a pretty good finisher, KO in the last one with ground and pound, KO in the one before, you see a decision there, a KO decision. I do think we're going distance. I think that Estevam is going to be tested a little bit in this fight here, but he's still going to get a clear win. Unanimous decision for Estevam over Jean Blagas Jumagulov. I couldn't be a Jumagulov backer. Listen, ultimately, I know the rule. If it's OV, we go that side. But if you're 14 and 8, if you've lost four out of your last five fights, the OV rule doesn't calculate. This isn't a Dagestani. This isn't a Chechnyan. This is uh, Jumagulov, who, in my opinion, loses this one. So we're going to Estevam to win. And I'll say he gets it done by decision. I like the Jiu-Jitsu kid. He's dangerous. Minus 155, Estevam. Jumagulov, plus 145. Listen, the line's not great to bet. He's unproven at the highest level. More of a fight pick as opposed to saying, oh, go run out and bet it. But if you are thinking, oh, I want dog money, are you going to chase on Zhumagulov, a guy who's a consistent loser in the UFC? I don't think he's valuable on the dog. Even if he somehow was able to pull it off, I don't think he will. I think Estevam at 11-0 moves to 12-0. And I actually think he's pretty solid for this flyweight division. Good frame for it, the grappling skills. Estevam might be a problem because he looked real good in that last one on the Contender Series. And he's got a good run through LFA as well. Give me Estevam. I think he's pulling this one out. Unanimous decision. And I think he's a prospect to watch. Be dope if he got a submission, though. That'd be huge for his stock. This next one, another OV. We got Ikram Alyaskarov versus Phil Hawes. Listen, the pick is Alyaskarov. There's no way I'm picking against two OVs on the same card. Come on, you guys know. If you know the channel, you know that I'm not doing that. Looking at this matchup here, though. Phil Hawes, dangerous guy, very quick, solid wrestling base too. Little bit chinny, inconsistent in fights. You call him No Hype Hawes. I think it's a terrible nickname, to be honest. No Hype. You got no hype behind you? I don't know. I feel like he's manifesting losses for himself here. The OV. Ali Askarov is a Sambo savage. Only loss in MMA is to Hamzat Chimaev, where Chimaev was unable to get takedowns on him and then caught him with just the meanest of fucking uppercuts. Holy shit, that was a beautiful punch. I think Ikram is actually going to be able to wear on a Phil Hawes. He'll get him to the floor at some point. I think he could find potential success with the finish, but I don't know, man. My heart's saying decision. I'm feeling like we might go distance. I think Ali Askarov could be tested a bit, but submission is definitely viable. The method of victory on this one's a little blurry because Phil Hawes is not an easy guy to tap out, but he has been sub before. Now, you know what? I'm going to go Ali Askarov by submission. That's the official call. I have a feeling he gets it later in the fight. I think he does lock up a sub. And I expect constant improvements from him too. I got to go with Dagestan here, the OV. Phil Hawes actually has a win over uh, an OV, a Dagestani before. Listen, how many guys are going 2-0 and in the UFC over two OVs? Um, it's a very rare thing to happen. And if you look at that win that he has, it was with Nazaruddin Amavov, who's a kickboxer from Dagestan, not a grappling-based killer like Ali Askarov. So I think Ali Askarov pulls this one out. He gets the win and gets a little redemption for the OVs, for the Dagestanis. Ali Askarov to win. He's a favorite. 2-1, to one, minus 200. Hawes at plus 180. As good as Phil Hawes has looked in some fights, He's just iffy as fucking others. And I mean, he got his leg fucked up bad against Delidze. Then he got knocked out too. So he's taking a fuckload of damage throughout his run. And I think Ali Askarov has a big opportunity to really burst on the scene here at middleweight. Because 
you know, besides the Hamzat Chimaev loss, this is a very feared prospect outside of the UFC, Eagle FC veteran. Give me Ali Askarov by sub. Next fight on the card. The big boys going at it. We got Parker Porter and Braxton Smith. Yeah, I'm going to pick Braxton Smith to knock him out. Before, I was like, no way. Is Braxton really that dude? But when you start watching this guy's fights, as fucking thick as he is, he kind of looks like the dad from Family Matters took a fuckload of steroids because Braxton is jacked. Not saying he's actually on steroids. I think he's just a genetic specimen. Freak athlete. Crazy power, great explosiveness. The dude's got high kick knockouts. Yes, the competition level hasn't been tremendous. And his one loss was in 2014, almost a decade ago. Who's it against? It was against a debuting Chase Sherman, crazy enough. But I actually think Braxton Smith has some good natural abilities. Very physically strong. Shown some capable takedown defense. And then you throw him Parker Porter, who's taken a lot of fucking losses throughout the run. Knocked out in a minute last time out against Tafa. And now you're putting him in there against a guy who's explosive and powerful. I think Braxton Smith is going to find that chin. I feel like first round knockout between these two. And Braxton, I know he's an underdog here. I think he's getting the KO as a dog. Especially Porter getting laid out last time. The chin might not be recovered. Because what was that, two months ago? You get knocked out two months ago against Tafa. And now you throw on Braxton Smith, another knockout artist. Yeah, Parker Porter can land some takedowns and fights. But it's not like he's this A1 wrestler. Braxton Smith, in my opinion, is going to have the strength and the hips to deal with the takedown attempts. And if they get striking, Braxton Smith clearly... Clearly more powerful, clearly faster. He's KOing him. First round knockout. And I think people say, yo, shit, Braxton Smith, welcome to the UFC. I'm a fan. I like his personality too. I watched an interview uh, with him. Plus 155 for Braxton. Parker Porter, minus 180. Give me dog money all day here. Knockout, underdog. I think he's a great dog. Little unproven maybe, but this is the great debut to prove yourself in. Similar heights too, 5'11 to 6 foot powerhouse in Braxton Smith, man. Way more athletic, way more powerful. Parker Porter, even in his wins, he lacks any impressiveness. I mean, he pulls off these decisions. But look at the three guys. Josh Preezen, Chase Sherman, and Alan Baudet. Not top level. I know Braxton lost his debut to Chase, but how many fucking years ago was that? Long time ago. J.O. Tornameda killed him and then top of flatlined him and it's two months ago. You got knocked out flat two months ago and you're bouncing back to fight another power puncher? Good night, Parker Porter, Braxton Smith, underdog snipe, knockout win. Welcome to the UFC. I can't wait for it. Shout out to Braxton Smith. I'm a fan. Next fight on the card, ladies going after it. It's Marina Rodriguez versus Verna Jandudoba. I'm going to pick Marina Rodriguez to win here. I just feel like she's more well-rounded. Women's fight though here, right? Things can go fucking sideways. Really, you have on one side a dangerous grappler in Jen Dudova, and you have Rodriguez, dangerous striker, but well-rounded. Very quick, good from range, multi-shot combos, moves really well. Pretty solid even in her grappling defense. And she lost to Lemos last time out, which in my opinion, no shame. Lemos is top caliber. She's a real contender. Jen Dudova doesn't have super dangerous striking. She has awesome grappling, but I just see it as almost, I don't want to say impossible, but very unlikely that she is able to just bully Marina Rodriguez and control her on the floor for three rounds. I think that Rodriguez is going to have successful striking moments. I think she's going to be able to separate and land a lot of big shots. What's a recent loss? Is Jen Dudoba lost to Dern? Jen Dudoba lost to Hebas? And I mean, you can see Hebas win there, Dern win there for Marina Rodriguez, like, to me, Marina Rodriguez is here, Jen Dudoba is here, and I'm not trying to use MMA math, I'm just bringing up relative truths that better grapplers than Jen Dudoba that were able to beat her in those spots, Marina Rodriguez handled, I think Marina Rodriguez is going to handle Verna Jen Dudoba over the three rounds, is it impossible she gets a knockout, definitely not, am I going to bank on a KO win, Jen Dudoba is pretty durable, she's a good fighter, so I'm going to go Marina Rodriguez to win by a unanimous decision, I think they're going long in this one, you look at even this fight though, I will say with uh, Yan Xiaonan, I do think that Marina Rodriguez kind of lost that one. So, you know, in a spot where in the past two, Rodriguez has struggled regardless of one controversial win. She's now fighting Jan Dudoba. It's a good bounce back fight at 36. She needs it. 16-2-2 is a tremendous record. 18-3 and on this side. Like, these are top caliber ladies going at it. And I think Marina Rodriguez to win. Unanimous decision. Official call. I feel pretty good about that one. Minus 125. People have bet the dog up on Verna. It's close money for Marina now. And I think she's winning. Plus 105 for Verna Jen Dudoba. Yeah, give me the uh, 
Give me the side of Marina. Some places have her. Juvent Verna, plus 145. That's crazy. But bet online, minus 125 for Marina Rodriguez, plus 105 Verna. Give me Marina Rodriguez to win by a unanimous decision. She'll outstrike her. She'll stop the grappling attempts. And she'll get, uh, you know, back to her winning ways as usual. Next fight on the card. Fun bout. Chaos Williams and Rolando Bedoya. I'm going to pick Chaos Williams to knock Rolando Bedoya out. I like Bedoya's style, and I think he's got a lot of potential in MMA. It's just Chaos Williams hits like a fucking freight train. He's a freak athlete. He's super light on his feet and explosive. I guess I don't want to say super light on his feet, but fairly light on his feet. Like, he'll explode in and out of range. At times, he gets a little bit stiff, um, and he gets caught with some decent shots, but he's never really showed me a faulty chin. He definitely can take a good punch. Bedoya is Mr. Unknown. I mean, his last fight... He took on a guy who had a nice record but was overweight, out of shape, fat in my opinion. Not Chaos Williams level. He's definitely got good multi-shot combos. He's a nice switch stance kickboxer who brings good forward pressure. But ultimately, I think Chaos can land the jackhammer punch. Bedoya, I don't think is going to be athletic enough to keep up. And I do think when Chaos starts stinging him with big power shots, Bedoya might have to look to grapple. But he's not going to have the chops there to control a Chaos Williams. So I think Chaos is getting a knockout. Probably in the first two rounds, maybe later. But I think Chaos Williams to win, pretty confident pick, man. I feel like he, you know, lost a tough one out last time. But, like, you look at the fights that he's he's fighting against. Michelle Pereira lost. That's fine. Randy Brown split decision. He dropped him twice. It was, you know, a tough fight. Brown's tough. Bia's a win. Selma's burger win. He beat him in the striking department where he shines. And you saw what he did with Jeremiah Wells. Abdul Razak al Hassan. he killed him in one punch. Chaos Williams has real knockout thud in his punches. And taking on a debuting guy who maybe... Has a little bit of an inflated record at 14 and 1. Hasn't really fought the top caliber. Like, yeah, you look, wait, but he beat a 10 and 1 guy and a 17 and 6. But these are not notable names amongst the regional scene. He's beaten guys, you know, that have nice records, you know, from different countries. He's a Peruvian fighter. And we've seen it before with fighters from that South or Central America region, both of them, at times. They are fighting in kind of the small pond. You might be 10 and 3 or you might be 15 and 1 or whatever, but ultimately does not mean that you're, uh, you know, a top caliber talent as far as prospect goes. I think badoy has got a lot of potential at 25. Doesn't have his age here, but he's 25. I think he's going to lose to Chaos, though. So Chaos by knockout, the official pick. He's a big favorite, and for good reason. He's probably getting a KO. Minus 300, Chaos Williams. Bedoya plus 250. I think Badoy can get hit too as he's coming inside, and Chaos's power would just be too much. And there's not enough power on Badoya's side, in my opinion, to hurt a Chaos Williams. Nor speed. Good fighter, but not ready for Chaos Williams. Knockout for Chaos. Next fight on the card. Big boys going at it. Light heavyweights. Devin Clark, Kennedy, and Zetchaku. I am gonna pick Kennedy and Zetchaku to TKO Devin Clark. And Zetchaku is a guy that can be taken down, but as tall as this dude is, he's resilient as they come. I see a lot of improvement with him. So when I'm looking at this match, I'm thinking, okay, and Zetchaku definitely getting better. Devin Clark, I mean, it's not like he's gotten worse, but we've seen him throughout the UFC for so many years now. We've kind of seen what he offers. He can bring heavy chain wrestling. He can take a good punch, but you can put him out too. Loves a fucking dog fight. Heavy pressure. Willing to let his mouth break in there and have his teeth shattered in. Kennedy and Zetchaku on the other side, I think coming into his own, has such a physicality advantage, 8-inch reach, 5-inch height. When you are 6 feet tall, trying to take down a guy 6'5", I don't care how good the wrestling is, Devin Clark is not Daniel Cormier. He's got decent takedowns, but it's not going to work for too long. I think he can land takedowns earlier on, but the fight's getting closer and closer every minute that passes. So Devin Clark, in my opinion, could actually get knocked out. I feel like he's going to end up getting knocked out because Nzechigo, as tall as he is, has a really nice knee straight up the center. He's got heavy punches. He comes in with power, and I think ultimately, Devin Clark is going to succumb to the knockout shots. Devin Clark's best way to win, though, is he's got to control all night. He needs three rounds, chain wrestling control, and avoid big shots. But I think that height difference is going to fuck him up. And realistically, besides, you look at Kute Laba, who Nzechuk, who just beat, who was able to take him down and control him early. Actually, Kute Laba has a win also over Devin Clark. Granted, Daun Jung has a win over Nzechuku and Clark beat him. MMA math is bullshit. Don't matter. Styles make fights. What I was going to get at is the fact that Nzechuku... Even if he's taken down, it's like we haven't really seen him bullied by grapplers for long throughout his fights. He beat 
a dangerous motherfucker in Kute Laba who's coming in with takedowns. Devin Clark is not this polished technical kickboxer who also can wrestle. He's a bit of a brawling striker. And Nzechiku on the feet, in my opinion, can do some damage to him. I'm going in Zechiku by TKO. He gets it done. As far as the lines here, they favor in Zechiku by a bit. He's around minus 175. Devin Clark at plus 150. So I'm going the Zechiku way to win. I think he's going to end up getting a stoppage. I get why people would like Devin Clark as an underdog at plus 150. But we kind of, I feel like I've seen his ceiling. There's more improvement happening with Zechiku, who's a lot younger. And I mean, the physical tools that he has 6'5, 83 inch reach. The body frame is one that can go far in the light heavyweight division. And I don't think Nzechiku is slowing down at the rate of improvement. Because I remember the early Nzechiku I was not impressed by. And then you start seeing him winning these fights, winning these fights. Goes out there and fucks up Kute Laba. That's impressive as fuck to me. Even his loss recently to Nikolai Negumedianu. Controversial. Bullshit loss. He should be on a win streak right now. I like Nzechiku. He's already on a win streak, but rather a three-fight win streak as opposed to just two. So give me Nzechiku to TKO Devin Clark. I think the height difference and the range difference is going to be huge, and I don't see Devin Clark having the abilities to control Nzechiku all night. Eventually, he's going to get hit with some big combos, and I think lights are getting put out. Next fight on the card, the featured prelim of the night, and I'm guaranteeing fireworks is Drew Dober versus Matt Frivola. I'm going to pick Drew Dober to sleep Matt Frivola here. I like Matt Frivola's style a lot, as do I like Drew Dober's. Both guys come with pressure to throw fucking hard shots. Drew Dober's chin, very good. Very, very good. Matt Frivola's chin, decent. We've seen his light shut off. Polo Reyes knocked him out a minute. Terrence McKinney flatlined him. He's getting touched up in fights because his style, this being Matt Frivola, is to sit in and bang. He likes to brawl at times. Is he now going to fully adapt and more go a wrestling path here with Drew Dober? Ultimately, it's not like Drew Dober can't wrestle. It's not like Drew Dober doesn't have solid takedown defense. And when you strike with Drew Dober, he makes you fucking pay. He's a gifted athlete, in my opinion. Southpaw stance, Training with savages like Justin Gaethje, you know he's with a good team. I just have to ride with the side of Dober to put his lights out. I like Frivola, fun fighter, New York guy, also reps Tampa, which, you know, it's where I'm at, so I got to throw some love to Frivola. He's got a fun style. I wish I could have picked him for the big dog money, but I can't. I think that Frivola's getting chinned, man. I'm thinking a knockout in the first or second round for Drew Dober, and it's going to be fireworks though as long as it lasts because ultimately with the loud new jersey crowd frivola is going to be going fucking ballistic i don't think he just tries to chain wrestle i feel like this could end up being fight of the night and i think dober is going to put frivola on his ass sometimes he squares up too much when he's mixing up shots and a guy like dober you can't mess around with the way he flatlined bobby green last time out every time with drew dober i'm like damn he looks better he looks better he looks better drew dober's a freak i'm going drew dober by knockout i'm not sleeping on him Looking at the lines, Dober sitting in that minus 200 range for Vola at plus 185. I'm going with the 2-1 to one favorite. I like Dober by knockout. I like this fight ending inside of the distance a ton. Maybe that under 2.5 could be a sniper play. We'll talk about that you know, a little bit later on in the week when all the props start releasing. So give me Drew Dober to get it done with a knockout over Matt Frivola in the potential sleeper fight of the night. Maybe not the sleeper fight of the night, maybe just the fight of the night. Let's jump to the main card. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Turn those post notifications on too so you don't miss a video. Cron Gracie versus Charles Jourdain. Drum roll, please. Cron Gracie, upset win. I'll tell you why. You go back and watch him fight Alex Caceres. One positional mistake, Cron Gracie is going to capitalize and submit you. I know. I know he hasn't fought in three and a half years. Lost to Cub Swanson. He got beat up in that fight, but he took a beating. Not chinny by any means. Very tough. Durable motherfucker who's got amazing jiu-jitsu. Okay stand-up. Kind of stiff and arm punchy. Charles Jourdain doesn't have the jiu-jitsu of a Cub Swanson. And he also, in my opinion, way too reckless. He makes way too many mistakes. Kron Gracie is going to capitalize on these mistakes that Charles Johnson makes. He gets... Charles Johnson. Charles Jourdain makes. He gets out of position. He throws and overextends himself. Yes, he had an awesome fight with Shane Burgos, striker. Yes, he had a fun fight with Nathaniel Wood that he lost, striker. Lost to Julian Arosa by sub, who's more a striker, but does have sub skills. 
Kron Gracie needs one mistake from you, he will put you in a bad spot and strangle you. The jiu-jitsu level difference between these two, in my opinion, is way too vast. I see that Charles Jordan is going to try to light him up on the feet. I don't think Charles Jordan is fighting with some safety first style. I think he's coming to kill a Kron Gracie who hasn't fought in a while. Ultimately, I don't question the chin of Kron Gracie. Before he decided to step away from the game for a while, Kron Gracie was on the fast track in the UFC. I mean, with just five pro fights... His sixth one is against Cub Swanson. His UFC debut is against Alex Caceres. That's huge. And look how good Caceres has done since that fight. Kron Gracie, I'm telling you guys, is really nasty. Cub Swanson was just a stylistic nightmare because of his jiu-jitsu game, overall boxing skills. And honestly, Cub Swanson's way more consistent, not making those mistakes, as opposed to Charles Jordan, who, like I said, puts himself in bad positions. Kron Gracie needs to clinch for a moment. He'll get the backside, he'll jump to it, and he'll strangle you. I'm going Kron Gracie via submission. I think in the first round, he's going to tap Charles Jordan out. And people are going to say, wow. Don't sleep on Kron Gracie. I know 34, he's been out for a bit, but his jiu-jitsu game never stops. And ultimately, it's not like he's going to turn into a K-1 kickboxer. That's not his purpose here. He's coming to do what he does best, and I think Charles Jordan is going to find himself in trouble here. Kron Gracie, submission. Looking at the lines, Kron Gracie, plus 155. I like Kron Gracie as a dog, guys. Even though he's been out for a while, you, you pay attention. He stays in great shape at all times. Charles Jordan, minus 180, the favorite. Give me Kron Gracie. Underdog, nasty underdog, sniper underdog, submission prop too. I'm going to play that sub prop as well. Money line and sub prop. I think Kron Gracie, stylistically, bad matchup for Charles Jordan. Kron's taking some time away. He's coming back with a vengeance here. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, he's strangling Charles. Upset win. Kron Gracie, savage underdog. Next fight on the card. Movzar Evloyev versus Bryce Mitchell. Movzar Evloyev is going to beat up Bryce Mitchell, guys. Bryce is good, real good. And he had an awesome performance against Edson, had a pooper of a performance against Deporia. It looked like shit in that fight. You know, said he was sick, whatever, and didn't fight to his top level. That's fine, but Movzar Evloyev is amazing. He's got really smooth stand-up. He's got excellent ground skills. Definitely the better striker, and I think the better grappler of the two. Thug Nasty Bryce Mitchell is good, man. He's a country redneck savage who's strong as fuck, good on the floor, okay with the stand-up skills, but doesn't have much punching power. Evloyev is way better technically with the striking. I think that he's going to win the grappling exchanges too, but he's going to be touching Bryce up on the feet. How does Evloyev get it done? Well, with Evloyev, we haven't really seen huge finishing ability. You look at the last five. Barzola, decision win. Who's doing well in belts right now. It's a good win. Grundy win, Nick Lentz, decision win, who's a good wrestler, Dawidu, decision win, Dan Ige, decision win. If Loyev is not going to push the finish, he's a smart fighter, and I think that's a good strategy with Bryce Mitchell, he's not going to put himself in bad spots. Bryce Mitchell, though, also doesn't have the knockout power. I think if he had more power, this fight comes a little closer. He doesn't have that option. No nuclear option here, so Bryce Mitchell, I think, has to beat him over the 15 minutes, and nothing tells me that Evloyev is not the better technical fighter overall. Striking, there's levels to the game. Grappling, positionally, Bryce is good. Evloyev's going to be faster with his transitions on the mat, and I think better with his takedowns. Movzar Evloyev gets the win, and I'm telling you, he is a prospect to keep an eye on at 145. He's next up, and my dream scenario is at some point, he crosses past with Ilya Teporia, and let's see who really is that top featherweight prospect on the come up, the next contender. Avloy for the win goes to 17 and 0. He's taken out Bryce Mitchell. Avloy a big favorite, minus 235, deserves that tag. Bryce Mitchell, plus 200 dog. After Bryce's last performance, I mean, I, I can't be surprised. Teporia whooped his ass, regardless if he was sick or not. Avloy of is going to beat him. Even if the Teporia fight didn't happen, I'd still be on Evloyev. I think that he's an excellent fighter. He doesn't have the OV at the end, but it's OEV. You know that's never a fade. Evloyev getting it done. Unanimous decision. Expect a showcase performance. He's actually shorter than Bryce by a fair amount, but he got the longer reach. Definitely better striking from distance. He's going to touch Bryce up. Evloyev for the W. I'm actually stoked to see him back. I want to see Evloyev fighting more often because I feel like the hype on him is kind of there, but like the casuals don't know about him. You're going to find out this weekend. He's that guy. Featured bout. Jessica Andraj and Jan Xiaonan. I'm going to pick Jessica Andraj. I expect her to be dangerous with her hands. Listen, last time out, she did the UFC a favor and takes a fight with Aaron Blanche Fieldov on, you know, seven days notice, whatever, shorter than that. Ends up losing. That was a savage underdog pick by me on uh, Aaron Blanchfield off just to brag about myself real quick because that was the underdog lock. Jessica Andrade loses that fight. 
She now is back at 115, which is better for her career. She fights a fellow striker in Yan Xiaonan, someone who's really good in my opinion, actually mobile as fuck with the stand-up, good speed, dangerous for sure. But ultimately, I think that Jessica Andrade is going to have a big power advantage. She's going to be better in the grappling department and on a full camp at, in my opinion, a proper weight class. I know Andrade did good at 125, but that's just because she's an amazing fighter. She did so good there. She was vastly undersized against everyone. I think Andrade is going to let the hands fly here, and I think on the feet she's beaten up Yan Xiaonan. Three rounds of competitive work. Ultimately, I respect the durability on Jan's side. I know she had a bad stoppage loss with Carla Esparza. Very different grappling styles between Andrade and, yeah, and uh, Esparza. You know, the style of Andrade is more so looking for striking knockouts and big punches as opposed to, you know, grinding on the ground. If she gets her there, maybe she could hurt her, though, because Andrade does have some submissions. That standing arm triangle with Amanda Lemos was tremendous. Andrade for the win, though. I'm calling it. I'm going to say unanimous decision. I respect the durability of Xiaonan and her speed's good too, but I think Andrade is just going to be better. She's going to land with more thud. She's going to beat Yan Xiaonan up. Xiaonan's not going to have the power to keep Andrade off of her, which in my opinion is going to be crucial because Yan Xiaonan does not have the grappling chops that she could mix in takedowns, put Andrade in bad spots on the floor. She's, she's got to strike. She's got to outstrike her, and it's not going to happen. Andrade is going to beat her. Andrade is a big favorite, over 2-1, to one, like minus 205, minus 190 at some spots. And then Xiao Nan at plus 175. Give me Jessica Andrade for the win. I am thinking unanimous decision. I feel like it's going to be a fun fight. I respect Xiao Nan's durability. I think she'll make it a good scrap. But too many clean strikes will land for Andrade. And I expect Jan at the end of it to be busted up a little bit. With Andrade, in my opinion, maybe, maybe next in line for the title. She's right there. She's right there. Let's keep on running up. Co-main event of the evening. Five rounds between Bilal Muhammad and Gilbert Burns. Guys, this one was a tough one because I have mad respect for both these guys. There's a few intangibles that we have to bring in. Gilbert Burns, more on weight, just recently fought against Maz Vidal in a three-round fight, which was a really good win for him. Bilal taking this fight. Obviously, both guys short notice, but for Bilal having to shred out weight. I was hearing he was weighing, like, was it 210, 215? Some crazy shit. I expect him to be on weight. I'm not concerned about that. I think he'll still have a good gas tank. But ultimately, where could he falter? The chin. As we get later into this fight, as much as I love Bilal, Bilal's always been a dog pick that I love attacking. I love the Bilal on the dog side all the time, but I'm not taking it this time. I'm going Gilbert Burns by fourth round knockout, maybe. Third, fourth, fifth. I think a later KO win. I think Burns is going to catch him with a shot over the top. I think early on they're competitive. But ultimately, Bilal's boxing is decent. He doesn't have huge power. Burns, big knockout power advantage. The better kicker of the two. Better jujitsu of the two. Bilal does have better wrestling. Gas tank wise, we can say that Bilal has a better gas tank. But Gilbert Burns is not fading in fights now. Like he's, in my opinion, peaked. I think this is the best version of Gilbert Burns we've ever seen. I also think that against Sean Brady, Bilal looked like the best version of himself that we had ever seen either. So in my opinion... As an MMA fan, this is the true number one contender fight. The winner of this fight deserves to fight against Leon Edwards because they have gone through the ringer of fire. I would like to see the winner of this fight get that. We don't know. Kobe Covington might get it because obviously hype sells. It's Kobe. But this is the true number one contender fight here. Guys who have grinded their way back to the top. Gilbert Burns, tremendous performance and a loss with Hamzat. In my opinion, brought his stock way up. Now two-fight win streak for him. Beat up Masvidal, I think he's going to hurt Bilal later. I think he's going to land maybe a right overhand, maybe a hook over the top, something. He's going to put Bilal on wobbly legs, and he's going to end up stopping him. I think maybe even ground and pound. I mean, it'd be crazy if he clubbed and subbed him. Not impossible, but I'm going to call a, a Burns knockout in the later rounds. I'll say probably championship rounds. I expect this to be a classic fight, though, because there's so much on the line here. These guys aren't coming to lose. Bilal, you can see, slight plus money. I love Bilal. I love him as a dog, but I can't pick him here. Plus 110, Bilal Muhammad, Gilbert Burns at minus 130. Give me Gilbert Burns to pull it off. And in my opinion, get the next title shot. The winner of this fight should get it. That's the truth. Because these guys fucking deserve it. Putting themselves on the line every fucking time. Stepping up on short notice to fight one another in a five-round special edition co-main event to, in my opinion, save the card here because they needed a good co-main event. Title implications. They have to fight for the belt. Winner gets it. And I think Gilbert Burns, Leon Edwards is coming soon. Let's jump to 
the main event of the evening. It's Al Jermaine Sterling versus Henry Cejudo. I'm going to pick Henry Cejudo to win, guys. His MMA mind is something that, in my opinion, is unmatched across combat sports. If you pay attention to his YouTube channel, his breakdowns are immaculate. He has the craziest understanding of not just MMA as a whole, but just fighting. He understands the boxing game. Obviously, fucking top-tier wrestler, gold medalist, triple C, flyweight champ. Bantamweight champ. I think he's going to be bantamweight champion again. And obviously his goal is to fight Alexander Volkanovsky, which is a real possibility if uh, Volkanovsky gets past Yeya Rodriguez. I don't think that's impossible if Cejudo wins this one. Obviously, Al Jermaine Sterling is a tremendous fighter. He's got excellent wrestling and grappling. Super long limbs. you got a big range advantage for Al Jermaine Sterling. Watch for the low kicks of Cejudo. Also, in my opinion, Aljo's not going to have that stinging power to keep Cejudo away from him. I can see Cejudo's boxing working nice in this fight. Also, note this. Al Jermaine Sterling, I don't believe, can land takedowns on Henry Cejudo. And if he does get him down, I can't see him holding him there. I would be shocked. It would blow my mind if Henry Cejudo is somehow in a backpack position like Piotr Jan. He won't be. Henry Cejudo will not be in that spot. His MMA mind is too great, I'm telling you. Cejudo's a freak. I think that Cejudo, with the time off, comes back better. People say, oh, but it's a layoff. He has been training these guys. You work with Henry Cejudo, you win fights. Kelvin Gastelum comes to mind. Davis and Figueredo, when he beat Brandon Moreno, was with Cejudo. Then he goes back to his own camp, he loses. Because Henry Cejudo, I'm telling you guys, is a fucking genius. Is an MMA genius. He's that guy. Cejudo's going to win the fight, man. I think that he's going to be able to touch Aljo up with punches. I actually think he can potentially get on top of Aljamain Sterling. Watch for low kicks. It's going to be a very technical fight. I think it goes all five rounds. And I think Henry Cejudo is going to take it on the scorecards. In a competitive battle, 49-46, 48-47. I do think there could be rounds dropped for Cejudo for sure. But he's winning this thing. Henry Cejudo is going to become the champion. He beats Aljamain Sterling. I feel like the matchup, the way that it goes... I just can't see Al Jermaine taking him down and controlling him. And I don't see Al Jermaine Sterling with the striking prowess to hurt Cejudo. I see Cejudo hurting Aljo on the feet, if anything. Henry Cejudo to get the strap. I said decision, but I'll be honest with you guys. As we sit here talking, I'm thinking there's a chance that Henry Cejudo stops Al Jermaine Sterling. I think he might knock him out. Third or fourth round. The, the pick, as far as method of victory goes, extremely tricky because it's the fucking highest level of MMA. But ultimately, I think Triple C getting his hand raised is what's happening on Saturday. Give me Triple C for the win. Give me the close money, dog. It's about even, actually, the lines. You're looking at minus 106 for Cejudo, minus 114 Sterling. It's flip-flopped every which way, depending on which book you're playing. It is a pick'em's fight, and for good reason. But ultimately, I'm going to go with, in my opinion, the fucking Albert Einstein of MMA Minds to win the belt. If somebody can take time off like this, three years, bounce back, Get the world title. It's someone that studies the game as in-depthly as Henry Cejudo. His time off, in my opinion, allowed his body to recover. He's now re-motivated. He hasn't gotten worse. He's gotten better. Henry Cejudo is going to beat Aljamain Sterling. This is the hardest fight ever for Aljo. Look at his opponents. Pedro Munoz is a good fighter, but he wouldn't hold a fucking candle to Cejudo. Corey Sanhagen. That would be a cool fight with him and Cejudo, but ultimately the grappling difference would be vast. Piotr Jan and Cejudo, I wish we could have seen that fight. Ultimately, seeing how Jan's career has turned out now, if you would have fought Cejudo, I'd pick Cejudo too. TJ Dillashaw, we saw what Cejudo did to him. Cejudo fucked him up quick in that fight, even though, yeah, drained TJ Dillashaw out at 125. It was TJ's choice. Henry Cejudo, to get his belt back at 135, put on the performance of a lifetime, and potentially set himself up for a super fight with Alexander Volkanovsky. That is the main event pick. Henry Cejudo for the win. UFC 288, guys. Holy shit. If you're not excited for this card, you're not a fight fan. Because if you look at it in-depthly, there are amazing matchups. I think I sniped out a couple of good underdogs. I wish there was more dogs, but I'm not just chasing dogs. I'm picking what I think is going to happen when that cage door closes. Last week was a tremendous one. Fucking absolutely crushed it as uh, the underdogs came through. With savagery, I mean, especially, fuck, man. Underdog lock, Cody Durden killing it. So, want a nice two-week-in-a-row lock streak for the underdogs. And I want to keep that momentum going. Stay tuned. Content all week. Make sure you guys smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Let me know in the comments what your picks are, especially main event. Throw me your favorite underdogs. Throw me your favorite picks, your parlays. And just let me know what you thought of the video. If you got nothing to say, if you enjoy the content, as always, drop a W in the chat. Content every day. Don't miss it. I'll be here. And then obviously Saturday, 
dope fight companion incoming. Much love, my people, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace, guys.